Yeah, well, I, I think it's interesting, and, and the effect is, is going to be very, is very complicated. And remember, about half of the global nickel industry is, is losing money at current prices, just above uh, 10,000 US dollars a ton. And, and I think the real problem here, particularly for, for nickel producers, is that um, long term they want a bit of certainty. They want certainty about what the supply numbers are going to be of the global nickel industry. They've got a decent idea of what demand is going to be. It, it grows at a fairly constant rate, doesn't change that fast. And, and three of the top five producers, Russia, Canada, Australia, they all turn out a pretty consistent 250,000 tons a year. Uh, the problem is Indonesia and the Philippines. As, as you well know, um, the Philippines has gone from producing very little five or ten years ago to uh, the, being the biggest producer in the world now, uh, 500,000 tons. Um, Indonesia was the biggest producer back in uh, 20, uh, 2013. Uh, and has gone to almost nothing um, since uh, because of some of its crackdowns on, uh, or on raw exports of, of commodities. So um, as a result of that, it's really very hard for producers to um, predict where the market's going to go. And that's a very scary situation to be in. Well, you know, it's a function of supply and demand, but it also is the fact that nickel does have the larger beta, so to speak, other than the base metals. But what are the drivers, what are the specific drivers for this volatility? Well, I mean, it is the fact that you have, the, you have this great political uncertainty. Uh, uh, you know, Indonesia, as we said, um, a, a few years ago, they, they, they banned uh, raw exports of ore, and that really caused a lot of the industry to pull back. Um, that, the, the, the way you can get Indi uh, raw ore out of Indonesia um, now, of course, is to build a smelter. But building a smelter is, is a, uh, um, financing a smelter is a hell of a lot more challenging because the Philippines ramped up production, and that's pushed your, that, that's pushed your supply up ahead of, ahead of your demand curve. So why would you finance a smelter when, when, as we said, half of the industry is losing money? Uh, now, just as the Philippines looks like ramping down with all these, uh, all these uh, mine checks that are being carried out by, by the government, um, you're seeing the Indonesia saying, well, we might actually um, allow a, a, a lower um, ore content, uh, nickel content in the ore we export which will cause that supply to ramp back up again. So a lot of people who've been, um, uh, who've been sort of banking on building smelters in Indi Indonesia to get ore out of the country, suddenly they're facing a, a, a vast flood of supply. And, and you notice Vale, which is one of the biggest producers in Indonesia, they're actually complaining they don't want Indonesia to, to loosen the restrictions. Now, you, you talk about half the global industry being in duress, but talk, some are more affected than the others. Talking about this uncertainty, who will weather this volatility better than others, and which stocks stand out to you? Yeah, sure. Well, I, I mean, one of the big points about the, the global nickel industry right now is that most, most producers are losing money. Um, BHP, uh, which, which produces from uh, mines in Western Australia, has, uh, they really only keep those mines going because it costs more to close them down than to, to keep them going. Vale has lost money on nickel for, for years. Um, Norilsk, uh, the big Russian producer, they, they, do, um, they do a little bit better. Uh, Glencore to some extent as well. Uh, I think one of the interesting things, though, is, is if you look at the, the big producers in the Philippines there, uh, clearly a mining industry never likes it when they're under attack, when they're being criticized, when, um, when uh, a, a government body is looking to shut down a lot of their pits. But those who survive, the last mine standing, have a lot to benefit from this process. What the problem with nickel at the moment is there's too much of it being produced. Uh, and if a lot of it is shut down in the Philippines, the Philippine mines that actually survive that process are going to be a lot stronger uh, than they were before. So in commodity markets, there's always these slightly paradoxical effects. And that's, I think, one that we, we can see going forward. David, finally, what's your outlook on the global mining industry as a whole by year end? And what signposts, apart from political risk, should we be looking for? Well, I think the, the key issue uh, for the whole uh, global commodities industry, and particularly metals, is of course what is going to happen to China over the coming months. Um, the, the key surprise of 2016 has been that we entered the year expecting uh, a, a dramatic shutdown, experiencing a dramatic shutdown of a lot of the, uh, of the Chinese uh, heavy industry that consumes about half of all the world's metals. Um, Around about March, April, that suddenly reversed and increased very dramatically. And there's been a, it's been a, a great boon for the metals industry that China is firing on all cylinders. Uh, but the question has always been, how long will that stimulus last? It's an industrial stimulus. Is it, is it a long-term factor in the Chinese economy uh, that will continue to play out? Or is it something that the, the government's going to turn off the taps? My personal view uh, is that the, the structural drives of this are going to keep it going for some time. Uh, but it's a, it's a nervous time for any commodity producer over the coming months.